Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We are about to commence the Sapro House lecture. May I request you to kindly switch off your mobile phones or put them on silent mode? Thank you. We have gathered here for the 28th Sapro House lecture, which will be delivered by the esteemed guest, His Excellency Dr. Danilo Turk, former President of the Republic of Slovenia, on Water and Peace a challenge and opportunity in Asia. Today's program will be chaired by Ambassador Nalin Suri, Director General, Indian Council of World Affairs. May I request DG ICWA to welcome the esteemed guest with a bouquet of flowers. Thank you, sir. Today's program is as follows. Welcome remarks will be given by the Chair, Ambassador Lin Suri. Subsequently, the 28th Sapru House Lecture will be delivered by the esteemed guest, His Excellency Dr. Danilo Turk. The lecture will be followed by a Q&A session. May I now request DG ICWA to kindly conduct the proceedings. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Zafar. Uh, good afternoon, friends, Your Excellency. Thank you very much for coming to Sapru House and agreeing to deliver the 28th Sapru House Lecture. Uh, you have chosen, sir, to speak on a subject of vital concern, not just to Asia, but to the whole world community, which is on water issues. And maybe some in the panel, in the, in the group, are wondering why you are speaking on water. The need I remind all of you that his Excellency, Mr. Turk, has been the chairman of the Global High-Level Panel on Water and Peace, uh, which has recently submitted its report, and he has chosen to speak of the challenges and opportunities that this poses in Asia. Uh, you have all seen his CV. He has a distinguished record. Uh, I think he is more than eminently placed to speak on this subject, and I don't want to stand between you and, and him, uh, but I will want to take this opportunity to to say that this is, while there were not too many members of the high-level panel really from Asia, but I think uh, the issues that have come out in the report and the recommendations of the report are certainly very relevant for those of us who live in Asia and where water is a problem and is going to become an increasingly bigger problem. With those few remarks, <coughs> may I request His Excellency Mr. Daniel Turk to deliver the Sapru House Lecture and we will take questions and answers after that. You have the floor, sir. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Suri. Uh, thank you for your introduction and for the kind words. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming to this event, which is devoted to the question of water and peace. Um, a subject on which I have worked in the last three years, and a subject which is of vital importance for international community, for the international community at large, and of course a subject which is of great importance in Asia. As Ambassador Suri explained, our panel uh, is a panel that was established uh, having in mind the variety of problems around the world and having had members from different regions of the world, including Asia. We had uh, members from Jordan, from Kazakhstan, and from Cambodia, the large regions. And of course, from India, we had a strategic foresight group, the think tank from Mumbai in India, which has done much of the analytical work prior to our uh, drafting of the report. So Asian issues have been present in our minds and in our work. And I believe that, in general, Asia is the most dynamic region of the world in every respect nowadays, not only in terms of economic development or political dynamics, but also in terms of environment, in terms of questions of the future of humankind most generally. The panel that <coughs> was established in 2015 uh, was established at the initiative of 15 member states of the United Nations. And it has interacted with the United Nations in a variety of ways so far. We had a meeting with the United Nations Security Council twice, once 
<coughs> in November 2016 and once in June 2017. Um, and as I will explain in a few minutes, <coughs> the Security Council is increasingly concerned about the questions of water in various situations which are on the agenda of the Security Council, including obviously the armed conflicts uh, which uh, take place and where water is increasingly an important aspect of the conflicts. Water resources and installations are becoming more frequently than before objects of attack and also water resources are used as weapon of war. So these developments which may not be universal are sufficiently serious to generate concern and interest in the United Nations Security Council and there is a need for a Security Council policy. Uh, on the other hand, the situations of peace are, of course, much more numerous. There are many more situations of cooperation, uh, which is becoming more important given the scarcity of water, which is becoming an ever more present problem of the world, and the need to find effective models of governance at the time when global climate change is affecting water resources quite dramatically. Now, the report that we had produced uh, is, looks like this. And since I'm chairman of the panel, I feel obliged to give, to make some kind of advertising for the report. It is available on internet. We have also shared it with the uh, Council, Indian Council of Foreign Affairs, of World Affairs. So I'm sure that it is easily available. It was drafted in a manner which was um, intended to attract more general public. Uh, we did rely on technical expertise but the panel was uh, actually motivated to produce interest for the subject among policymakers, journalists, and others who <coughs> write and who comment on these questions and who need to be given uh, a kind of uh, narrative that is sufficiently user-friendly, but again, sufficiently well-founded on, on facts as known by the experts. Now let me refer to some basic facts which, which demonstrate the dramatic nature of the problem of water today globally. Uh, today about 2 billion of people lack access to safe drinking water. Uh, water stressed, violent regions are areas where this problem is most pronounced. And the United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Goals have put uh, the question of water and sanitation quite high on the agenda. This year, the, um, uh, the global high-level discussion on uh, Sustainable Development Goals in July, which is a new form of work of the United Nations, the uh, high-level policy dialogue, that discussion will focus on water in every aspect. So it is really one of the early questions of sustainable development goals that will be put on the agenda of the United Nations. It is estimated that by mid-century around 4 billion people, around 40% of global population will live in water-stressed areas. Uh, and if we look at just one situation, which of course is not violent, but it says something about water scarcity, the situation of Cape Town, a major city of South Africa, we can see the drama coming, and this type of situations can happen in other places in the world as well. Uh, <clears throat> at the same time, about 40% of the global population lives in, the, in areas of shared river basins and shared aquifers which means that international water cooperation is a major aspect of use of water and water problem in general. And of course that cooperation in water issues is more and more important. Global warming, on the other hand, is creating additional problems. Most um, effects of global warming are actually projected through water, either in scarcity or through violent weather events, which produce huge floods and disasters and destruction water. And then if one looks into a slightly more longer term perspective, one cannot fail to see that in the next 25 years the world will need to produce about 50% more food and double the energy production. And production of food and energy production will also create an additional pressure on water resources. So we are dealing with a problem which is not necessarily very visible everywhere at this, at this time, but clearly is one of the fundamental problems of, uh, of the future. I have mentioned already the importance of international water cooperation, and here I can say that that cooperation is, generally speaking, lagging behind. 
it is not sufficiently developed, it is not developing sufficiently quickly. Uh, there are 286 shared river basins around the world involving 148 states, but only 84 these river basins have arrangements uh, for water cooperation, only 84 out of 286, and not all of them are effective. So we see that the institutional structures, uh, cooperation arrangements are not following the needs and are not reflecting the reality um, uh, of water resources as, uh, as it exists. Now let me come from this general picture to the situations in Asia. And of course I have to say I'm not an Asian, as, as you know, and I do not pretend to have any profound knowledge of the problem of Asia. But like everybody else in the world, uh, I can understand Asia as the most dynamic part of the globe at present, and one which everybody has to, which everybody has to watch, because many things that will happen to the world will originate in Asia. And we have to see that um, in Asia the water situation reflects some of the typical features of the world as a whole, both abundance of water in some places and water scarcity in many other places, cooperation in some areas, uh, tensions in other areas, and of course situations which include armed conflicts as well. And in fact, some of the contemporary armed conflicts uh, have happened in Asia, parts of Asia, and have been characterized by water to a very serious extent. And let me just briefly mention the most uh, obvious among them, Palestine uh, and the Jordan River Valley uh, question continues to be an important aspect of the whole problem of that part of the Middle East. Then the questions of Syria and Iraq have become very much characterized by the questions of water. In Syria, the protracted period of drought created social tensions, migration of people from the eastern part of the country to the coastal area of the west, adding to social pressures, adding to conflictual situation, and then uh, erupting in, uh, in an armed conflict. So water was a major contributing factor. Uh, in Iraq, we have seen that after the uh, the war, um, the situation has not been stabilized, that at the time when the Daesh has uh, become a major problem in Iraq as well as in Syria, uh, the uh, evolution of the situation in Iraq has shown uh, that Daesh has withheld water in some parts, especially in the area of Fallujah. Uh, first withholding the water to the people downstream, then flooding areas in order to uh, punish the people, infecting about 12,000 people in one occasion. And there were also instances of poisoning of water resources by oil. So, I mean, we have seen the element of water being used in that unusual and very dramatic uh, armed conflict which, uh, which hasn't been finished as, as yet. Uh, the problem of Euphrates uh, River in Syria has also been a major feature of the evolution of the armed conflict in Syria since 2011. Now, of course, Euphrates has a long history of both cooperation and tension, and there were situations of severe tension in the past, in 1975, between Iraq and Syria over the building of what was then called the Al Taura Dam on Euphrates, uh, now called Tapka, also known as Tapka Dam. Uh, and during the recent, the current armed conflict, we have seen a variety of situations involving the use of water resources as an instrument of war. Again, Daesh has uh, threatened the population downstream of the Tapka Dam on Euphrates with the possibility of opening the water and uh, uh, flooding the area. Now, there has always been a question in political analysis of that part of the, um, water the, the, the war theater, whether Daesh is really prepared to go that far, because the counter-argument was that the actual position of the people downstream of Tabqa Dam was not so negative against Daesh, and therefore it would not make sense for Daesh to create a large negative effect in whatever form on the population. Indeed, nothing, nothing terrible happened, but the tension has been always there, and it has been part of the larger 
um, situation of armed conflict in Syria. Now that situation, was, that specific Tapka Dam situation was ended in May 2017, last year, uh, and that dam was taken over by the uh, forces uh, belonging to one of the Kurdish groups, the YPG. I happened to be in Istanbul in Turkey for a conference at the time when that happened, and I could compare two different interpretations of that event on Turkish television, one shown by, the, uh, by, by CNN and the other shown by Turkish media in English language. And it was interesting to see how the international network of CNN uh, uh, hailed the development and suggested that this is a major um, victory in, 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 uh, in that conflict, and clearly it was an important event in that sense. But on the other hand, the Turkish opinion was much more cautious and was saying, well, you know, this is just one of the militias taking over an important water installation, and who knows how that would affect further development of armed conflict in the country. And as we can see now, the complications are rising. They are not concentrated on Euphrates per se, not on Tapka Dam. They are taking place further to the north. But they are part of a larger situation in which uh, the water issue in the Euphrates area is not resolved. And it is a part of the complicated picture for Syria for the future. Now, of course, if one looks uh, looking from the specific experiences of the past years uh, into a bigger picture and asks a question for the future, one would say, look, every war has to end at some point. And as history has shown, when peace agreements are seriously negotiated, water cooperation necessarily becomes part of the peace arrangement. We have seen these things happening in other parts of the world, in particular in Europe, which has been affected by wars for several centuries uh, quite consistently and where in every peace arrangement starting from the Peace of Westphalia in 1648 onwards there has been an arrangement for water cooperation. One of the more recent examples of that trend uh, is actually affecting my part of Europe, uh, the Balkans, where uh, Sava River Agreement was the first multilateral agreement among the countries, successor states to former Yugoslavia. It was understood that water cooperation on the river, which is a major river flowing through several of the countries, successors of Yugoslavia, and which is a major tributary to Danube River, that that cooperation is necessary for the future uh, peaceful arrangement and peaceful cooperation among countries in general. Obviously, one can think about the uh, peace arrangements uh, involving Syria, both internal arrangements which would need to deal with the issue of water governance in the country, given the importance of water in that uh, country, uh, which would necessarily include Turkey as a, the upper riparian country for the Euphrates region, and which could ideally, I say ideally, far from clear whether that might actually happen, involve a larger regional arrangement, which ideally would include, obviously, Turkey, Syria, Iraq, and possibly Iran for the larger uh, Euphrates, Tigris region, uh, regional uh, river arrangement, which, of course, would be an ideal, uh, an ideal arrangement for the future cooperation among the countries of that region. So, as we have seen from the recent history, uh, the questions of water are continuing to be features of armed conflicts, and that has to be taken into account when thinking about future water cooperation more generally. Now, obviously, in Asia as a large and very diverse region, uh, we have seen a great deal of water cooperation and a great deal of experience in water cooperation. Some formula have been very successful and continue to be quoted as such. I should mention, since we are meeting in New Delhi, obviously that industry um, river arrangement continues to be appreciated by experts globally as a successful water arrangement, uh, which of course was established in 1960, but which continues to be important, promising, and effective. Uh, I'm not sure whether everybody in the room would agree with that assessment, but that's the assessment that we hear about when talking to experts from various parts of the world. 
Obviously, the Indus Treaty uh, arrangement is special because it actually is based on a clear division of water resources between the two countries, but it does include effective mechanism, the Commission, and the possibility, the capacity, the mechanism for settlement of disputes as they arise. And these are important mechanisms which give, uh, which should be used as a source of, a, uh, of inspiration for similar arrangements that might be necessary elsewhere. Um, obviously, I have to be humble here. I do understand that in India as a large country, as a great power, uh, one has to appreciate the complexity of water issues. And I'm not suggesting that I came to uh, give a lecture on how to organize water management and water governance in India. But I did follow the developments uh, in the past years and by coincidence also last week when the Supreme Court of India gave a very important ruling on water resources within India. And it was very interesting to read this newspaper article. I haven't seen the, the, uh, the judgment and the pronouncement by Judge Mishra on this uh, subject, uh, but I did read the newspaper articles about it and I see that the um, important principles that have been announced in that uh, pronouncement uh, really m make a lot of sense both for uh, dealing with water governance within a country and also for international cooperation in water governance. Uh, for example, no state can claim exclusive ownership. This, this of course has to do with the federation of India and the relationship between different states. No state can claim exclusive uh, ownership the erstwhile Harmon doctrine is explicitly rejected, uh, doctrine which is based on the idea of complete uh, territorial governance. Uh, then the notion that actually in the fair distribution of water resources, one has to take into account a variety of factors, not only simple mathematic or simple arithmetic formula about quantities of water that has also been announced in this judgment. And um, uh, very importantly, the judgment recognized the uh, nexus between rivers and aquifers, something that we also need at the international level. In the, in the international level, we do not have a sufficiently developed understanding of uh, cooperation in shared uh, aquifers and shared uh, areas of uh, underground water resources. So I'm mentioning this judgment because I find it so central to the whole international discussion on water management and water governance. And I should perhaps just by way of illustration in this connection quote or mention the principles of international law relating to the um, international water cooperation, uh, which obviously is something that you are familiar with. Um, um, Ambassador Suri was in New York at the time when the um, UN Water Courses Convention was finalized and adopted back in 1997. Uh, and um, as uh, you will know, uh, this convention uh, contains several principles which come very close to what the recent Supreme Court judgment in India has pronounced. Uh, and let me just quickly go through the list. Equitable and reasonable utilization of shared water resources. Principle number one. Principle number two, the principle not to cause significant harm, uh, an important principle, especially in the, uh, with the aspect of water pollution. Third, the principle of obligation to cooperating, to cooperate, taking into account geographic, hydrological, environmental, climatic, and other factors. In other words, a complex picture has to be recognized. There is no single formula for dividing water resources, but all these other aspects have to be uh, taken into account. <clears throat> the principle of the duty to exchange information, exchange information between riparian countries in order to reduce the misunderstandings regarding the quantities and also quality of water. And then also, <clears throat> finally, fifthly, joint mechanisms for management of uh, water resources and dispute settlement. So these are the kind of basic principles which we find in the international law, international water law, and which we have seen recently being um, sufficiently relevant and, uh, and um, justiciable 
to be used by a Supreme Court of a, of a large, complex country like India, and I'm sure that this judgment will have a great deal of, uh, of um, reverberations uh, across the globe. It, I think it's an important, it's an important um, uh, judgment. Now, <clears throat> let me come to the next question, and that is uh, how do we, proceeding from, from there, proceeding from the understanding of the problem of water in contemporary armed conflicts, and proceeding from the experience on water cooperation, how do we look at the opportunities that exist, which of course is a separate set of questions, but related to the previous two sets, uh, water cooperation opportunities. Now, I think that the progress globally is there and um, shouldn't be neglected, but it is not sufficiently fast, it is not sufficiently complete. There are um, sophisticated international mechanisms which can be looked at and which can be used as, as examples, not to be copied because really there are no two uh, situations which would be exactly the same, but there are situations which could be compared and where mechanisms that have worked in one place could be seen as useful to, another, to the other place. Uh, in Europe, uh, I think that one of the most um, successful examples has been the Danube River uh, system, which uh, which uh, has actually started in 1856, but has gained the current shape after World War II in 1948, and subsequently it's a complex system which allows for cooperation in a, a very wide variety of questions uh, ranging from navigation to environmental protection, control of water quality, flood management, uh, prevention of disasters, and all other aspects. So there is a wealth of experience which can be looked at and which can be used, but of course not copied. There, are, there is a wealth of experience which can be used uh, in, um, in designing other systems in other parts of the world. One of the most sophisticated mechanisms that our panel has um, encountered is in Africa, is the Senegal River system. Senegal River is a river which, is a, um, which flows on the borders of four countries uh, in Africa, Guinea, uh, Senegal, Mali, and Mauritania. It's a border river, very important one, where the riparian countries have established a common organization, organi organization for uh, joint management of the river, Organisation de la Mise en Oeuvre, the Fleuve de Senegal. It's an interesting organization because the riparian states have agreed that all infrastructure which is built on the river, all the dams, all the power stations, all the irrigation systems are jointly owned. They are not owned by individual sovereign states, but they are jointly owned. And the decision making is um, uh, given to the uh, organization, to the, to the OMVS, which takes decisions on a variety of issues, not only on investment, not only on protection of environment and other typical questions, but also on some of the issues that are more uh, important nowadays. Our panel has visited that commission and has visited some of the installations on the river, and it was a very interesting experience that we had in a place called San Luis, which is a, which is a place close to the point at which Senegal River empties into the sea. It is on the border between Senegal and Mauritania, and there is a dam built on that river which prevents salt water entering too far into the river, and therefore, of course, that dam protects the agriculture along the river of, um, uh, of bo on both sides, on Senegalese and on the Mauritanian side. I had an opportunity to talk to the chief of the security service on the, on the dam, and I asked him whether in his area the question of terrorism has become a sensitive matter, because we have seen in that period, that was in the year 2016, that the work the, well, the work that the activities of some terrorist groups, um, the successors to Al-Qaeda in Africa were approaching Senegal, approaching that area, and that we, uh, that Senegal had to be quite careful about uh, the danger. And it was interesting that the chief of security told me, well, actually we have a system which protects our dam quite well, and that is we work with the entire local population on both sides of the river, 
they know very well that if a dam is somehow damaged, if it doesn't produce the effects for which it was built, then agriculture and our livelihood will suffer everywhere. And therefore, the cooperation that the security people had with the, um, um, uh, with the local population seemed to be quite sufficient as a, as a kind of uh, belt of protection against any uh, threat uh, to security of the dam. So uh, the mechanisms do exist. They can be looked at, they can be studied, and they can be applied in other parts of the world. I would like to say also that we in Asia clearly see certain positive signs of development uh, in areas where that development was either blocked or was limited. I would like to quote two such areas which I believe are important, and maybe in a discussion you can tell me what you think about them. The first among them is Central Asia, uh, which essentially um, means uh, the successor states of former Soviet Union, uh, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, and Kazakhstan, where uh, since um, last year, since a little more, a year and a half ago, we have seen a very promising positive development. There was a change of power in Uzbekistan. And as a result, the level of cooperation has started to grow. Uh, the countries are discussing their problems, including, of course, cooperation in water issues, uh, much more openly than was the case before. And also, very importantly, uh, the UN, which has established uh, an office, um, uh, an office for peaceful cooperation in the region, based in Ashgabat, um, and I see uh, Ambassador. Um, see, um, uh, uh, Nambiar here, who was chief the chef de cabinet of the Secretary General at the time when that office was being established at Ashgabat. It was, of course, not, not clear uh, how effective that would be. But now it has become very popular among Central Asian states. It has produced two draft agreements on water cooperation on um, the two rivers, on Amudaria and on Sirdaria. And now it is hoped that slowly that cooperation will go to a level which is needed between the countries. The upper riparian countries being rich in water, Tajikistan and, and uh, Kyrgyzstan, and the lower riparian countries needing water in particular time of the year. So there are very good reasons for better cooperation, but uh, still the politics was not right. In a few weeks from now, uh, at the time of the World Water Day in uh, March this year, I will go to New York uh, and will take part in a panel uh, together with the Foreign Minister of Tajikistan, who will come to that panel to talk about water cooperation. And I'm really curious to see how far has the problem of water cooperation become a subject of actual decision making in a positive direction in the uh, Central Asian region. The other positive development that I would like to mention, uh, the opportunities, uh, relates to the Mekong River Basin. Now, Mekong River is, of course, an important river in Southeast Asia, which uh, is important for a variety of reasons, which I don't have to uh, enumerate here. But I would like to say that its current importance is illustrated well by the fact that uh, the number of um, uh, power plants on the river and the tributaries has become very large. Eleven power plants are being built or projected in, on the main flow of the river, and about 80 on the tributaries. So it's a, it's a major development in that area. And of course, there is a great deal of history of cooperation among the riparian countries. Uh, where, uh, which included um, the Mekong River Commission, the uh, ASEAN uh, as an organization, African Development Bank, and um, as of recently also China has become much more active in that area. Uh, the, uh, in 2014, the um, government of China has changed its earlier attitude, which was much more reserved. It, uh, it, uh, it entered into the cooperation much more actively. The, a new mechanism was established, the Langkang uh, Mekong River Commission, uh, river mechanism uh, has been established, and that mechanism has started to produce very interesting political results. Uh, among them, uh, the most recent one was a meeting of the prime ministers of all the riparian countries, which met in Phnom Penh. 
and which have adopted a very ambitious project for the five-year plan on the Mekong, which would involve a great deal of investment from China, but which is intended, at least uh, at the level of surface, uh, formally, to help uh, to modernize the whole area, to, uh, to contribute to poverty reduction, and to strengthen complementarity between China and ASEAN countries more generally. It's part of the Belt and Road philosophy, which is nowadays so central in the thinking of policymakers in China. Obviously, there are concerns expressed about whether the projects which are contemplated now would create environmental damage, whether they would be sufficiently based on the actual demand of the lower riparian countries and so on. And obviously, these problems have to be addressed and resolved. But there is no doubt that the new era is coming for an intense cooperation in the Mekong area, and it would be very interesting to see how it evolves. Now, let me conclude by saying that, obviously, water cooperation is one of the oldest of types of international cooperation, and I would add one of the most needed cooperations today. Uh, it can take a variety of forms. It can be either bilateral or regional, although our panels kind of tendency has been to, 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 to promote thinking about regional cooperation to cover the entire water basins, river basins and aquifer basins, wherever that is possible. We, the panel members, quite well understand the political sensitivity of this cooperation and the fact that it is not always possible to go for such ambitious projects, but we would like to make a contribution to kind of move the policy thinking and policy making in that direction. It is important that certain basic principles of water cooperation have been established both in international law, in the international conventions, and also as we have seen in India in the Supreme Court judgment. And finally, that it is very important to think about permanent mechanisms, not only about the rules that govern policy making, but permanent joint mechanisms which can help managing and governing water resources on a permanent basis and also to resolve disputes whenever they arise. These are the kind of thoughts that I, would want, that I wanted to share with you. Let me once again show you the report and invite you to take a look at it. It is drafted in a manner which should be sufficiently user-friendly, not to be too boring or too, too technical, but it contains also a very long list of um, uh, specialized literature that we have studied. We have also consulted over 100 experts globally, had several expert meetings and so forth. So what we are saying is, I believe, well-founded, although user-friendly. And that is the spirit in which we nowadays uh, present our report in various parts of the world, and we hope that this will help. Thank you very much. Yeah, Mr. President, thank you very much for a very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, my question is on, uh, you know, basically, yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm Ashul Sajinha, former ambassador. Yes. Uh, thank you for your presentation. You know, I was a little perplexed. You mentioned that there is this increase in cooperation and collaboration. And you mentioned the Mekong uh, uh, Basin as one of them. Now, of course, uh, what is being done as far as the Bukong Basin is not since 2014. It goes back to many, many years. Sure. And uh, in that context, uh, what has been done downstream as far as uh, Cambodia is concerned in terms of deforestation, in terms of silting, in terms of uh, the capture of the water in the higher reaches by China, and what is the very uh, harmful, adverse, deleterious impact it is having on the lower riparian uh, countries. Uh, similar is uh, something, you know, what India has been experiencing as far as the Brahmaputra is concerned, because there we don't even get to see the hydrological information from uh, China. And this year we have seen that even the quality of water that has been coming down has uh, uh, been uh, very, very uh, bad, very thick, silty water that has been coming. So when you discussed Asia, and of course, you know, I could mention the case of uh, Ili and Irtish, which go from China to Kazakhstan to 
go on to meet uh, River Ove in Russia. So there also, the point that I'm making is that many of these uh, lower riparian countries, as it is, they are in a disadvantageous position. And their concurrence is sought to be bought by China by giving them some monetary loans, you know, like as far as, and because these countries are smaller and not as powerful, they are afraid to raise their voice. I know about Kazakhstan, what happened. So, uh, you know, in your recommendations, I'm sure in your book, there must have been, a report must have been recommendations. So has there been something on those subjects as to how the upper riparians, I know that there is a law which uh, many a times is not really followed. The responsibilities and uh, the obligations of the upper riparians, they are not followed. But uh, have you considered uh, these other cases also of uh, Brahmaputra, of Ili? You mentioned about Amudarya and Sirdarya. But there are also, in addition to the problems of uh, Tajikistan, it is also the problem in Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan because they are consuming so much of water inefficiently for their cotton cultivation. So, you know, meaning you mentioned these are complex issues, but if you'd like to share some thoughts on this. And uh, maybe the last one is, do you think technology can help in any way? You said about uh, scarcity of uh, water. Uh, do you think technology can uh, help uh, in uh, uh, meeting with this uh, uh, problem? Thank you. It's a handful of questions. Let me say that on this um, fundamental question of relationship between upper riparian and lower riparian countries, we have seen a similar pattern practically in all situations. Um, you mentioned a few. I could mention, let's say, um, uh, Turkey and Syria, for example. If you can talk to um, uh, people with uh, good knowledge of the situation in Syria, they will also they will always explain that the uh, water installation on the Turkish side have reduced or otherwise affected the water that comes to Syria. If you talk to the Turkish interlocutors, you will hear that the uh, demand of the lower Italian country, both Syria and Iraq, is to always have more water while not paying enough attention to the quality of water governance in their own country. So it would always have that tension. And the question really is, uh, how does one um, approach this at the level of uh, any general principles? Because, of course, the individual uh, arrangements have to be situation-specific. Uh, here, uh, I think the fundamental thing is to uh, accept the importance of the principle of demand of lower Italian countries. Demand in various ways, not the demand only in terms of quantity of water, but also quality of water. And uh, the question is then, um, what kind of systems have to be put in place to protect the environment of the lower Italian countries? Well, this is a fundamental thing that has to be put in place in an appropriate manner in every situation. Uh, for example, in the case of the Nile River, this has always been a discussion. And now with the, with the development of the Renaissance Dam on, uh, on the Ethiopian side, uh, this has in a way become more um, difficult, but on the other hand also a certain type of rebalancing has taken place which allows for more technical discussion between the two countries. One of the problems in this uh, context is that it, while it is possible to figure out what would be the legitimate demand of lower Italian countries, that's possible to define in technical sense. It is extremely difficult to develop a political understanding of what the actual legitimate demands of the Let's say lower Italian countries is. Because um, we, when, whenever these questions come to the media and to the, to the political discussion, you are likely to, to have distractions. So, in short, I would say, well, lower Italian countries should be seen as a, 
should be seen as a priority area of concern. Their legitimate demands have to govern the arrangements for water management. The environmental aspects have to be given particular priority, and that, of course, applies to Nikon River especially, but it applies also to other places you mentioned, the, uh, the Amu Valley and Sio Valley in Central Asia, and Mutatis Mutandis, that applies to other countries as well. And then, obviously, what I would like us in the Council of World Affairs to think is how does one manage the political side of this problem? Because you will always be able to find technical solutions or technical analysis. But how does one uh, manage the political side of it? For example, and we have learned in our work in the panel that on Brahmaputra there is a degree of cooperation between India and China. It's more discreet and more, I should say, practical, more pragmatic than declared. But when it is raised to a level of a political discussion, it becomes more difficult. So where is the way forward? What would be the right, how do I say, mixture of technical uh, knowledge and technical uh, uh, promise and political wisdom? Also, after all, countries have to, uh, have to coexist. They have to co 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 evolve. Co evolution is necessary. Uh, and of course, um, we don't have. We do not have any prescription in our report, but we do emphasize this kind of fundamental uh, requirements that have to govern the type of situation. I might just clarify on the Brahmaputra. We have very limited agreement on exchange of data during the flood season. And, and even that is not coming. And it's against mm -hmm. But to the music, Mike, did Thank you, President. I have written one small piece on GCC water security in that I found that these countries does not have, do not have river system at all. And they are relying totally on two factors, one fossil water and other desalination. While fossil water is uh, drying up very soon because the virtual cost is very high. And uh, they are greatly forced to rely on desalination. And in top 10 countries, five or four countries holding uh, the top in top 10 countries of the world who are meeting their water demand to desalination. And this, has, this is also creating uh, environmental problems in Persian Gulf through salt and silting, all these things. So is there any new technology in desalination which can uh, improve the chances of getting more water without ecological problem? And what about uh, uh, the Israeli technology which is doing in this direction. Second question is that uh, I want to focus on uh, security of this uh, reservoir, especially the Gulf countries like UAE and Saudi Arabia are building underground water depots and they are feeling threatened by the terrorists which can be targeted. And third that uh, after the division of Sudan there is a problem in Nile water system. What is the prospect and of resolving the conflict? Thank you. Yeah, um, first I have to answer the question of technology, which, which was part of <laughs> that I skipped in my first uh, reply. Well, on um, various technology uh, approaches that exist, uh, our panel has um, focused on the experience of countries like uh, Singapore, Japan, and Israel. These are countries which have shown a great deal of um, progress in terms of both recycling of water and uh, desalination. And there, there are technological solutions which can work, uh, which again uh, are not um, politically or financially feasible in all situations, uh, but where a kind of inspiration for technological solutions can be found. As far as the GCC countries are concerned um, and their desalination projects, this, I must admit, our panel has not studied in particular detail because the prevailing view has been that the existing um, types of desalination are still adequate. 
that's the view that came up in our direction, that the potential environmental damages are not too high, and that the cost of desalination is sufficiently low, especially given the fact that these are uh, oil-rich countries where energy is not the major, it's not the decisive concern. So, in a sense, the Gulf area was not seen as those, one of those uh, areas where either environmental damage or high cost would represent a basic problem. Now, we may be wrong, you know, and uh, our report, like any other report, is open to critical analysis, criticism, and I would welcome a discussion to see whether the kind of um, uh, narrative which we offer and the kind of recommendations that we make are actually adequate. So, I would welcome any critical remark that could be written about, about our um, uh, report. On the um, uh, underground water depots and the security issues that um, are becoming more and more important, not only in areas like uh, in dark countries where, of course, underground depots are a new way of uh, establishing um, a sense of water security, um, we noticed that obviously states are developing uh, technologies for uh, better protection of water resources and water installations, that counterterrorism has reached that area of protection of water installations. And obviously this is a subject that requires not only encouragement, but we believe also a degree of exchange of information at the level at the global level. But this is not happening now. One of our recommendations relating to security and the UN Security Council is to stimulate international exchange of information and cooperation on the question of technologies for protection of um, water installations. On the division of Sudan and the problems of the Nile, I must say that we haven't looked into this in any particular detail and the whole situation is evolving on a daily basis practically, so it is hard to say what would work. I mean, we would need simply to find ways of stopping the war within the South Sudan first before anything further and anything really serious is, uh, is, uh, is, can be proposed. Please. My name is Gil. I'm an Indian to hide your international law. Yeah. I'm a master of that. Uh, you touch India, in your now what I see the most of the problem that you have mentioned about Baran Putra is a constitutional problem between state and center. Between have you had a chance to look at it in our constitution, the division yeah. of power is such that this problem arises. The central government doesn't have full control over the sources of water river. Number two, coming down to the international level, you are referred to the convention and uh, Helsinki rules, you didn't say so. Now, why is that the world has not ratified in general so that the problem could be solved much easier? Mm. If these in instruments are ratified, the problem could be solved. So, in your report, have you covered this? And further, this report has been released to the government. Your report has been released, released to the government. Sure. Right, thanks. Yeah. Thank well, on the um, conventions, we actually, we have a chapter on international water law in, in the report and recommendations which, of course, uh, advocate broader ratification, broader um, uh, uh, accession to the two major conventions that exist. One is the Water Courses Convention of 1997, the General UN Convention, and there is an interesting other legal instrument which is also discussed in the report, and that is the UNECE, the Economic Commission for Europe um, Convention on Water Cooperation, which was adopted earlier in 1992, but which has been subsequently revised and in 2016 opened to accession to all member states of the United Nations. So one of the points that we are making very strongly is, well, expand the number of accessions and share the not only substantive substantive principles, but also the mechanisms which the convention, the UNSCE convention offers. Now we understand that the problem with this convention essentially relates to what was the subject of the first question that we heard. I mean, upper riparian countries are extra 
careful not to uh, accept obligations which may limit their action uh, in future arrangements with their neighbors. That, that's, that's the fact of life. Uh, but uh, the international panels like ours are only able to advocate a solution which benefits everybody, so we will continue to advocate that uh, and we'll talk to the upper riparian countries wherever we can and with whatever effect we can hope for. Uh, now, um, as regards the uh, nature of the report, I would like to say that that report was, uh, um, was launched in September last year in Geneva, in uh, Switzerland, because Switzerland was the most, uh, how should I say, interested country to have this panel uh, established and to produce a report. Uh, we have done so, and after that we also will have, we had some meetings in New York and Washington where we were promoting the ideas of the report. Uh, we see that with the uh, sustainable development goals, the attention to water issues are growing, is growing, uh, and my hope is that it, the report will be a contribution to that discussion which is much needed. What I do not suggest, and I hope I didn't give a wrong impression in my presentation or in my answers, is that we have solutions. We, you know, solutions have to be negotiated uh, individually or within the states, bilaterally and regionally and otherwise. But the um, general tendency in which, uh, or general direction in which these processes should go are uh, indicated in the report. To that extent, we could, of course, agree on, 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 on an approach, on a policy direction, but of course we should not, and we did not have an ambition to provide solutions for every situation that exists. Is that on the net? Yeah, yeah, sure. Sure it is, and it also is, I think, in the... It's on the net. Yeah, it is on the net, yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you so much, sir. My name is Tuti Banerjee from the Indian Council of World Affairs. And as you just said, sir, uh, it's, a, it's not a question of solutions, but maybe uh, you can take it forward to looking at solutions in the sense when you're talking about future technologies and how they will help in water sustainability and better desalinization programs, maybe you can also look at what are traditional technologies mm -hmm. and traditional ideas. Uh, I can speak on the technologies or ideas that are being developed in India is a lot of communities in India are going back to the traditional way of conserving water on how to harvest, uh, do agriculture, which was um, in a way which went away from them. And now it's coming out that they're not only being able to conserve water in terms of getting drinking water much better, but groundwater levels have increased in a lot of villages, not just in one particular, but surrounding areas. So maybe it's a suggestion that the countries in Asia can look at it as an opportunity to go back to traditional methods of water conservation and technologies, as well as you know, adding it to the future technologies. In yeah. fact. Thank you. Look, I very much agree with your approach. As you will see from the front page of our report, there is a um, uh, this, is, this is from Peru. Uh, this is a kind of an assembly of a local community around a lake which could be potentially affected by the development of industrial and mining industries. And obviously this has to do with conservation of water resources, protection of water resources, using the traditional, these are indigenous people, uh, traditional techniques. Um, and we have a chapter in the report which deals with what we call people's diplomacy because in many situations the critically important task for the government is to provide first a legal framework and, um, and a kind of scientific analysis but it cannot provide the, all the solutions that are necessary. So what, what is needed is a kind of more intense and diverse participatory arrangement which would allow all the stakeholders to play a role. And those stakeholders, they, of course, include civil society or whatever we mean by that. I mean, people at large, their organizations, their initiatives, 
and uh, also obviously the businesses and others who are involved in specific projects. Our panel has visited Costa Rica, for example, and we were told about a situation in one of the rivers in the country where there were programs supported by the government for building power plants, but uh, those uh, were subsequently not carried through because of conservation uh, arguments that were made by local people. And uh, the, the whole development was you know, redirected as a result. So, I mean, there are various ways in which the interests and legitimate needs of people are coming into the picture. Our report speaks about that and speaks about the need for establishment of mechanisms which help the water governance to take into account conservation needs and other needs of, of local people. Yeah, thank you, Excellency. I wish to bring to your kind notice about the, some chemicals in the water, particularly in Haryana, Punjab, where we have used so many chemical pesticide, fertilizer, and some parts of Punjab have become so carcinogenic, the whole district is suffering from cancer. And there is one train going every week to Jaipur for chemotherapy. And some parts are suffering from fluoride. There are so many other chemicals also which are a health hazard. So how you are dealing with this type of problem? Hmm. Well, of course, uh, here um, I cannot be of much help, you know, to, to explain on the situation in Punjab. I mean, I'm sure that in this room there are people who know much more and who have much better ideas of what would be, what would be the real solution to, to, uh, to that problem. We have a chapter in the report speaking about um, water quality, water pollution, and uh, international cooperation in that regard. Now, there are two important priorities as our panel has seen them for um, international cooperation relating to water quality. One is monitoring. Uh, the international organizations that exist have developed standards of water quality including the maximum uh, acceptable levels of different types of pollutants are either chemical or organic in nature. Um, that uh, have to be you know, standards that have to be followed. FAO has developed such standards for agriculture. Uh, WHO, World Health Organization, has developed standards based on health needs of the people. So standards exist. The question is monitoring. And that monitoring has to take place first at the national level, obviously in the countries themselves, but also at the global level. And here at the global level, we do not have as yet a sufficiently good monitoring system. Now, individual organizations are doing some work in that regard. Europe obviously has certain advantages because European Union has developed monitoring systems so that we do not only have standards of water quality but also monitoring mechanisms and actually quite effective law including judicial protection of uh, people against, uh, against uh, water pollution that goes beyond you know, standards of what is acceptable. So in short, um, our panel could not, of course, go into the details of national policy making and national needs. That, of course, has to be done nationally. But we do insist on standards as developed at the global level through WHO and FAO and on development of a monitoring mechanism that would somehow be of a global character. We shall see this year. I mean, I'm looking forward to the discussions which we shall have in March in the United Nations um, on the World Water Day. To what extent will these very important questions be already present in our discussion? To what extent it would be possible to go beyond the current fragmented nature of international mechanisms, which do exist but which do not work in a coherent fashion? And then, obviously, in July, when this uh, high-level policy dialogue on the questions of water in general will be uh, held in New York, we'll probably see how far the international community has